Why can't I lose weight? Which over-the-counter pain reliever should I use for my child? Is there a cure for baldness? The doctors choose Healthcare for 1000 and answer a variety of questions. The doctors are on call tonight. Fever in the morning, fever all through the night. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight is the Ask Anything show. Recently I finished a four-year leadership responsibility with the American College of Physicians, also called the ACP. This is an organization of more than 120,000 internists, women and men dedicated to being doctors for adults. About half of the people in this organized medical group are internists that have gone further and trained in one of the subspecialties such as cardiology, rheumatology, endocrinology, and a bunch of other ologies. But other half are generalists, like my guest tonight and myself. My responsibility was for the South Dakota chapter uh, helping organize our yearly state meeting and developing programs to enhance the quality of care we provide here. For example, one effort we worked on in South Dakota was to encourage physicians to prescribe exercise more. Aside from the local responsibility, I traveled three or four times a year to national meetings, giving the national organization an opportunity to have a Prairie Doc perspective. In doing that, I have been delighted to make many new friends, and some have already come from as far away as New Jersey and Florida to be on this show and share their knowledge with you, the on-call audience. Tonight, we are truly blessed again and delighted to have from Indiana University the good Dr. Michael Shaw. He is an assistant professor teaching general internal medicine and geriatrics to medical students and residents and practicing at the VA in Indianapolis, Indiana. We had planned to have another guest from the ACP, Dr. Mary Rapazzo, who is an attending in the Department of Medicine at St. Peter's Hospital located in Albany, New York. Unfortunately, yesterday, we found she could not make it tonight, but we'll move forward without her uh, to answer your questions, and we start with you, Dr. Shaw. Welcome. Glad thank, to have you here. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about uh, you. Where are you from? You grew up where? Uh, I've been a Hoosier for many years now. Um, been uh, lived in Indiana since about 1981. Uh, yeah, you were born in Indiana? Uh, no, but I've lived there long enough that I would consider myself a Hoosier. You were born? Uh, actually, Pennsylvania. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So, but you are a true blue Hoosier. I would consider myself. And you teach, uh, uh, how, what percentage of time do you teach? Uh, roughly, probably 80-90% of my working week is uh, spent teaching. It's really, I think, a great experience to work with our future Physician. So you've been teaching for how many years, Michael? Uh, about almost 10. Almost 10 years? Yes. So, and then you've been involved. You were with the ACP uh, when you were a resident or a med student, weren't you? Or what was that? How did that get started? Well, I got involved in uh, the American College of Physicians because my program director called me into his office one day and said, Michael, I want you to serve on this committee. And since this is your program director, your boss, asking yeah. you to do something. Uh, the answer is, of course, probably going to be a yes. Yeah. And, and um, I just know that you are so organized, so thoughtful, so 
um, smart <laughs> that you you got involved very early on, and that's why the ACP was you know very happy to have you. And then you became a governor, and yes. and in my class, so uh, something like thirty of the uh, other governors uh, were in this class together. You and I and Mary, and we've just had wonderful friendships uh, develop with that. It's been a joy. It's been a wonderful five years. It's a, it is it, it <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so but. Teaching is what you primarily do, and so you've got all that knowledge just packed in there, ready to answer, and we've got questions coming from everywhere, so let's take that first question. Sure. On CBS News this morning, there was a report that children born by cesarean section were more likely to be obese babies, and I wondered why that would be. Well, that's interesting. Um, now, did you have any answer to that question right off the bat? I had not actually heard anything about that, um, but I guess it's um, something obviously uh, in the popular media. Have you heard anything well, about it? Well, I, so this gentleman asked that question, I looked it up, okay? okay? <laughs> I wish I knew that answer. <laughs> I did not know the answer to that. I did not know about the literature, but I did look it up. And here's the interesting thing. I did research on obesity uh, when I was teaching at Emory. Kind of like what you, you're doing, but I did that a, a while back. And uh, we looked at babies, and the, uh, the, the, size, the original data said the size of a baby does not indicate the size of the adult. What really worries you is when the child is in their early teens. That represents what gonna, they're going to do. And this study showed that the, uh, the people, uh, and I looked it up, the people, uh, the, is a, it's a three-year study. The babies that were born of C-sections, there's a there is a 16% um, incidence of obesity at year three okay. in, that, in that group. Uh, and if you've not been born of C-section at the year three, there's a, there is a 7.5% incidence. Oh. So we know that at three years, sure. now we don't know about adults. We don't know whether that represents what's going to happen in adults. And they don't know why it is, although they've speculated that it's the 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 infection uh, infectional environment of the vagina that helps protect you, but uh, you know it's all theory. Well, you know babies are sterile. Or, I mean, uh, they don't have any bacteria on them when they when they <laughs> pop out. <laughs> why, why they're gestating? That's right. So they're perfectly sterile when they come out, aren't they? That's the amazing thing. What about obesity, though? In your in your thinking, uh, how, there's an epidemic. Is it, it there? Certainly is in South Dakota. How about Indiana? Well, you know, I work at the Indianapolis VA, uh, and unfortunately, obesity is a s tremendous problem. You know, I think nationwide, I mean, there's, a, of course, a correlation between obesity and diabetes. And yes. Na nationwide, the prevalence of diabetes is about 7% of the adult population. In my personal practice, it's 40%. So I'm so dealing with a population that's quite A lot of diabetes. Obese, yes. And, and obese. So, um, th that they, pre they predict that something like 40% of, of, of Americans are going to be obese in another 10 years. What is your, you, do you predict that? Oh, I, I, I completely agree that this is, a, I think, a huge problem that the United States will probably need to be dealing with, uh, not only at the individual level, but I think that there are important public health initiatives that the government can undertake to try to help change this trend? Well, one thing that, that they started with, which was a wonderful thing, is called the National Children's Study. Unfortunately, they're backing off on it because it's an expensive thing, but it would have found all the environmental factors that possibly could influence a child and follow them until adulthood. And they started it, but they're fizzling out because there's not the cash, apparently. Right. Have you, are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that, but I mean, the analogy would, be, of course, be the Framingham study, which is, I think, at this point, multi-generational, and it's really clarified our understanding of heart disease. So, so that kind of a thing should be done by the government. The government should be following through on the children's study, and the fact that they're backing away makes, uh, breaks my heart. We need to know the reason why people have this epidemic in this country, and we're not understanding it. And it's bringing on, it'll bring on early death and lots of disability. And if you think it's expensive now, wait until all those obese diabetics hit the age bracket. So can I ask you a, a hard question? Sure. Since we're, since South Dakota is an agricultural cut yeah. state, and I'll mention Indiana's one too. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts about fructose? 
I mean, do you think that there is an association between fructose and obesity? You know, the corn, sh corn syrup um, <laughs> thing? I, I don't know. What do you think? I, I don't, I, you know what, I, I follow the literature. I think there's some light literature. I don't think there's a lot of really solid uh, data on that. But, you know, I, I, I have not read proof, the scientific proof to support that. I think there's a lot of, you know, rumor. But Associations. What do you think? Well, I think it probably is um, reflective of um, the amount of processed foods that people are eating. Yeah. Um, that processed foods probably do contain more fructose. Um, and Maybe. as a society, we are eating more processed foods than I we used to be. I think there's a correlation. It isn't really the fructose. It's, it's all of this middle aisle, uh, non uh, fruits and vegetable yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Too, too processed. Yeah. And it's too easy. It's too high caloric. Uh, and you know, the government has supported uh, certain kinds of farming that makes certain things very cheap, which has promoted pop and yes. a lot of corn syrup and lots of sweetener, and it has made us obese. I think it's part of it. I would say, though, the bigger part of it is a lack of exercise. Now, I, was, I completely agree with that. Do you? I, I really think that uh, we can talk about eating right, but I think it's the lack of exercise that's the biggest part of it. You agree? And your audience knows that you're a runner. Yeah, they do. <laughs> so, are you a runner? I am not. <laughs> you're not, but do you exercise? Some. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't go into that further, but you could do more, couldn't you? I could, yes, definitely. I have taken up a mile a day as a walk to a place just, just a mile a day. If all we did was a mile a day walking, it would be a good thing. And I think that's important that the audience be aware that walking is an excellent form of exercise. Yeah. A little bit more than just a casual walk, but a little bit of briskness yeah. where you're a little bit out of breath, I think is helpful for yeah. everyone. Yeah. 12 blocks makes a mile. Walk away from your house six blocks and home. One mile. Do it I don't know. Day. In Indiana, it's 10 blocks makes a mile. Oh. We have better blocks here. <laughs> So let's take the next question. Dr. Holm, I am a chiropractor here in Brookings, and my question for you today is, how do you see chiropractic uh, as the profession and the services they offer fitting into total patient health and their overall wellness, as well as managing uh, the aches and pains that you and I both deal with in our clinics? Well, um, Michael, any comments? Well, I think chiropractors can offer a very beneficial service. Uh, I, I guess I don't know if I have much more to comment beyond that. Yeah. I, would, I would say this, that when I was a, a freshman medical student, uh, we, uh, Nat Carlin and I did a, a newsletter for the med students. We organized it and we'd get all these people to write little articles and we made a newsletter. We called it the Bowel Sounds. <laughs> and. Uh, and so we were going to call it borborygmus, but nobody knew what that was, and so it's, it's bowel sounds. You know what uh, I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, the, the uh, first essay, the first article, I, I, I said, you know, the problem is that the MDs and the chiropractors don't get along. There's this lack of relationship, this unfriendly distance between the two groups. So I wrote, I called a, a chiropractor and I asked him what he thought. He says, it's not our fault. I mean, we're trying to be friendly. I mean, you know, they just reject us. I subsequently called my local home physician who turned green and didn't want to talk. I talked with another two or three other MDs and they didn't want to talk about it. There's, there has been a tradition of hard feelings between the groups. Uh, you know, some of it might be uh, just the traditions of from whence they came. I, I certainly believe there's data, scientific data, that supports uh, the approach of musculoskeletal pain by the chiropractors as effective or more effective than some of the things that we do. And that's a field of, air, of medicine that we just struggle with all the time. People come in with musculoskeletal pain, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? Well, there's certainly, I think, a component of laying on of hands that, that can be therapeutic. And we're, we're doing less of it. it we, uh, physicians, uh, MDs, are doing less of it. Uh, and I think that it would be more important if we moved in that direction, more hands-on, take the lesson from the chiropractors. I do, I would make this comment. I think chiropractors, physicians, naturopaths, herbalists, whatever they may be, I have no problem with any of them 
when they're doing what they're doing mm -hmm. based on science. Mm -hmm. When they're doing something that doesn't have a scientific base to it, then I have a problem, whether it's a physician or a chiropractor or anybody. So I think you need to have, when you say science, I mean you've got to have it based on truth. And I, I think there are, there are people in all areas that, that base some things that aren't based on truth. They're based on selling a product. So I would veer away from that and finish again with, we need to work and collaborate together with chiropractors. So there's an element of disclosure. That's right. All right, uh, the first email is, uh, my hairline has been receding. Is there a way to stop balding, a cure? Michael, you obviously don't have that problem. <laughs> I think that's the fortunate happenstance of genetics. Um, now, I, there are some products out there like Rogaine yeah. um, that does help uh, prevent hair loss. Yeah, that's um, minoxidil, I think, isn't it? And then they put it on topical. Right, and you have to continue to use it in order to maintain um, or to, pre to prevent any additional hair loss. Uh, but I don't know of any other products out there. That, that, are, that are viable. You know, I, I don't think so, and I don't think that the herbs and spices that people sell that promise to do things in the newspapers are of any value, do you? Uh, no, no. There, what, there is one thing that you can do. You can go to a, a specialist that transplants hair from your underarms and plants it in tufts. They need to do it just exactly right. I thought that you could take hair from the back of your and, skull. And yeah, hair from the back. Maybe that's where they do it. I don't know enough. Enough. Maybe you're right. I I'm wrong <laughs> on that. But all I can say is I uh, that's rather aggressive. But you know, it's it fills a, uh, the bill for some people. They really feel like they need it. I think the the trend to just shave if they're getting too many receding hairline is is okay. So you, you like the bald look? You know, I think it's okay. I mean, you know, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I. Yeah, but uh, we're, yeah, we're we're you and I are fairly lucky. I, I'm an older guy, and I've still got some hair, although it's kind of thinning a little bit, you know. But you know, so be it. That's where I, I mean, we get what we get, don't we? Yeah, but it, it may be interesting for some scientists to probably look into why hair on the top of the scalp gets lost before the hair on the back of the yeah. scalp. Do you have you heard any answer to that? I have no idea. I don't know that either. Uh, so let's take another question from the street. I happen to pick up a summer cold. Uh, what can I do to prevent it, and uh, how do I treat it? Michael, how do you prevent a summer cold? Well, I think prevention is probably the key thing here. Uh, I think diligent hand washing. Um, it, it, Most of it, the virus is hand, and then you put it in your face and your nose and your eyes and so on and so forth. Yes. I think the uh, CDC um, initiative to have everyone cough and sneeze into the elbow, I think, is quite helpful, too. Right. If, uh, the, you, but they don't. I mean, people still, you can just see them when they're not, in, you know, but they're spraying it into the room, you know, <coughs> into the air. I would just please, if you don't have a tissue, tissue is the best. Cover it, catch it in the tissue, throw the tissue away. If you don't have a tissue, though, as a rescue, into your, your, but don't spread it that way, or cough into your hands and then, hi, how are you, and shake hands <laughs> with them, you know. And if you're sick and you want to go to church, okay, sit in the very back, cover your cough, don't shake everybody's hand when the, when the friendly greeting time comes by. Yep. Very how sensible. do you treat it now? I mean, is there an antibiotic that you can use for the cold? Well, colds are usually caused by viruses, and antibiotics don't help with viruses. They, they just don't make a person feel better, and they might do harm, like? Yeast infections. Um, there's also, you know, the concerns regarding uh, antibiotic resistance um, by bacteria. And you uh, sent me an issue about the concern for Clostridium difficile. Uh, a recent CDC study shows the prevalence of C. difficile infections and mortality, which means death rate from overgrowth infections in the colon, yes. uh, have reached historic heights, not hysteric, I wanted to say, but historic heights, and the condition spreading in inpatient and outpatient care facilities. What is that? What is that a result of? It's antibiotic overuse. Right, because the antibiotics we have nowadays are not specific for a particular type of ant for particular type of bacteria. Um, you, your gut is full of bacteria, many of them quite helpful. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about p the potential benefits of uh, these bacteria that might help prevent obesity. 
uh, these antibiotics can wipe out those good bacteria as well and leave Terrible real overgrow. state for bad bacteria to overgrow. Well, and I mean these horrendous diarrheas, that won't go away I mean, and, and will kill people. Yes, yes. Have you seen any uh, C. diff infections that have killed anybody in, in your own personal experience? I have not seen anyone die from it, but I've had several patients who've had really protracted episodes of long, C. difficile illnesses and, and over and over and over and over again. Oh, oh it's, it, it's pretty bad. It's a bad thing. So don't ask for antibiotics for the common cold. One other comment, oftentimes summer colds that last, you know, weeks, 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 weeks are, viru are, are not viruses and they're not a cold at all, they're allergies. And I think the best treatment for uh, allergy is a steroid nasal spray in almost all kinds of allergies. Uh, the coughing allergy, the nasal drainage allergy, the eye allergy, I think the steroid nasal spray is the best. Now, yes or no? I like that approach too uh, because it's really focused um, on the area that's sort of causing a problem as opposed to taking a pill that might act systemically. Yeah, the Claritin, it's twice as effective as Claritin or any of the other non-sedating antihistamines. Well, keep in mind, I'm, a, I'm in geriatrics, so those antihistamines also have um, anticholinergic effects, meaning that they can affect some of those uh, uh, brain neurotransmitters and can increase risk for older adults that have confusion and falls. So The last thing you want to do is confuse older people, even younger people like you and me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we like to say, you know, the steroid nasal spray is a good idea. All right. Uh, we have another question. How important is vitamin D? Is it different for women or different for men? We had two people asking this. Of course, the, uh, the uh, CFO of the hospital asked that very same question. I want to say thank you, Kevin, for that question, but you're not going to make it on the TV show. But uh, this gentleman asked one about vitamin D and, uh, and asked about men and women. What, what's your take on vitamin D? Everybody has an opinion on this. Well, vitamin D is a little bit different from perhaps the other vitamins because vitamin D is actually a vitamin, um, a chemical molecule that our bodies can actually make from sun exposure. So from a traditional st definition of a vitamin, um, vitamin D is not technically a vitamin, but you know, in our caveman years, you know, we were running around, I guess, naked or with a little piece of fur running, covering us, and we got a lot of sun exposure. But nowadays, you know, we have clothing, we work indoors, uh, that we don't really get as much sun exposure as our uh, caveman ancestors. Yeah, I, you, you make a visual for me. I'm seeing this guy with fur and, you know, and all this, you know, these naked people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But the vitamin D is an important thing, isn't it? I mean, without it, I mean, they're, in fact, they've associated low vitamin D with not only, you know, softer bones, but also heart disease and uh, more cancers and a whole slew of different things. Have, what do you, do you think those are true? So I think what we do know is that low vitamin D levels are associated with um, rickets, which um, are experienced and typically by uh, infants. Right. Um, osteopenia. Uh, thinning of the bones, which can affect uh, older adults. And uh, there's pretty good literature about um, low vitamin D levels being associated with uh, fall risks in older adults. Okay, so we, we've got proof of those. Yes. And there is weak, but not solid, but still indicators that there are other things that can go with it. So at this point, I'm saying 2,000 for everybody, unless you're uh, six weeks or six months old, and I'm thinking that then you're 400, but you need supplements. Everybody's saying supplements for everybody, and there and the national numbers that that came out, they were saying something along along like 800. Also said that under, that 4,000 or less is safe. So you know the FDA currently recommends 600 units. Yeah, I don't think it's enough. I think that science is, it, but they're slow. They should not be jumping on a bad wagon. They should wait for the data. The Institute of Health said 800 for the elderly. That means 60 or older. That's not really old. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, I would say that certainly uh, you're not going to hurt yourself with 2,000, and there's some data to support it. Correct. So, I, I mean, I think the data really shows that it's very hard to get to too much vitamin D if right. you're taking 1,000, 2,000. I think I saw in the over-the-counter that there was a 5,000 unit capsule. Yep. So. Do you smell these flowers? I don't. 
I, you, you need a steroid nasal spray. Baby. <laughs> All I can say is that my thank you for our uh, my wife and our beautiful uh, garden outside, and I'm I'm no just noticing these beautiful flowers. We we thank you. We've got a th another question: Which over-the-counter pain reliever should I use for my child? Well, I think the current recommendation that you know, not being a pediatrician, you know, I'm actually take care of uh, people at the other end of the age but spectrum. But they kind of grow into peds, you know. We start out young, and then we get healthy, and then we kind of go backwards, don't we? Uh, incontinence. Yeah. <laughs> the whole story. But so, what about uh, what about pain relievers? Uh, so I think the my understanding is that um, aspirin is probably should not be used um, as a pain reliever in For children. children. Um, other than that, I think judicious use of products like uh, acetaminophen, generic uh, Tylenol, Tylenol. Is, a, is a probably a pretty good option. Right, and you know, uh, if you go into the ibuprofen group, okay, musculoskeletal, all right, but it's, you know, it's not been proven better, really, than the, than the acetaminophen or Tylenol. Correct. And there are toxicities to it, more than the Tylenol. Now, Tylenol also has toxicity. Last week, we had a show uh, on, with a kidney doctor, there wasn't a pain reliever he liked, oh. you know, and uh, right. and of course my rheumatologist would friend would, would disagree. But the point is, I love what you said: judicious use, use it carefully, use it uh, reluctantly, and when you need it, okay. But don't go well. Now I'm I'm thinking I'm going to feel tough tonight. I might just have one, you know, before I go to bed. Using it every day, every day, every day, that can be hard on those kidneys. Correct. Even with Tylenol. Yeah. So you're recommending Tylenol for children, and I agree with you. I generic think Tylenol works. Generic Tylenol <laughs> is cheap, and it is, when used judiciously, is a good choice. Yes. Well, let's take another question. Generally on television or in other news media, you see advertisements about particular types of medication with all the side effects that they have on many of the medications. It's a wonder that they ever get prescribed in the first place. I'm wondering why do people even want to take these if they can complicate their life or their health with all the, by taking a particular medication? An intriguing question. I love that question. Thank you for that. I think we are a med over medicinalized country. I agree. And you know, if we didn't hand out drugs, then they'd go to the herbs. I think we, you know, we were made to eat correctly, and exercise correctly, and, exercise correctly, and boy, most of it is good. And I think we, I think, of course, though, there's wonderful medicines that make a huge difference in some people, and they need it. I have a patient who has Parkinson's disease. I prescribed a new medicine today. I'm thinking he's going to feel a lot better with it. I've got somebody who is just blue and depressed and angry and sad, and, you know, I'm getting them to exercise. That's my first plan. I'm getting them to talk to their family and their counselor and their church people, and... I'm adding a, an SSRI because it makes a difference. It helps. There's important medicines. Do they have side effects? Yes. Yes, they do. So you have to be aware of them. I think, though, you can be over aware. Right now, I think, you know, they didn't, when I started practicing, they didn't hand them two pages of lists of side effects. Right. Now they do. What's your comment about that list of side effects? I think they're important. Um, I think it's very important that patients be an advocate for their own health to be informed. So, you know, when you get prescribed a medication, inside that package is a product insert um, that lists, uh, I think, should be, it should list the same type of side effects as the gentleman heard on the uh, television. Um, it's important that they be aware, but it's also important that they be aware, keep it in perspective. Those are potential risks for side effects. Most people actually do not experience any of those, uh, but they need to be aware of the potential risks. Right. And, and uh, so, and, and I think also polypharmacy of the elderly is a big and bad thing. You're a geriatrician. What, what does the geriatrician literature speak about numbers of medicines and? Oh, uh, older adults take absolutely a huge number of medications. Sometimes it's necessary. Um, older adults tend to have multiple chronic medical conditions. Um, but I think it's important for patients to work with their physicians to see to review the medications periodically to make sure that... Do they really need that? Do they really need to be taking all those medications? Yeah. 
Um, and I think what you said a little bit earlier regarding the management of depression is very critical. That the answer to a lot to a lot of problems is more than just simply handing a pill. For a depressed patient, a pill can be very helpful. I think talking to friends, family, colleagues can be helpful. But socializing, you know, to really avoid that self-isolation that comes with depression, I think is really critical to try to overcome those conditions. Wow, very, very good, good. I love that answer. Well, let's take another question. What does coffee do for you? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, Michael, <laughs> what, what do you think about that? Well, I would point out that you're enjoying the coffee. And you're drinking water. <laughs> you're not a coffee drinker at all. I am not. And uh, is there a reason? Uh, not particularly. I just, I'm one of those few people who actually went through medical school and residency and managed to survive without coffee. I, I, that's where I learned to drink coffee. You know, <laughs> and I started with sweet coffee with cream, you know, and then they didn't always have that in the medical school lounge, you know, so you started drinking it, you know, straight and then pretty soon hooked. <laughs> so it's an addiction, there's no question about it, and I drink a bunch of it. But I, you know, I've been very interested in the literature, and I remember reading in, eight, in the mid-80s, you know, we think there could be some problems, and the big studies are coming out, and we're going to have the answers in six months, and here they're coming in three months, and here comes the answer, and there's no problem with coffee, unless it upsets your stomach. Uh, if you can, you can overload with it and make people have seizures, but you know, you gotta drink a lot of coffee to do that. And there are actually a couple of uh, recent articles that indicate that uh, I think coffee use is, is, is can help prevent some instances of, or at least postpone instances of dementia. I don't know if I'm completely sold on the idea, but I, I think moderation may be the, the key here. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that prevent and, and help may prevent dementia, and coffee may be one of those. Exercises, definitely. You, in fact, you sent me a thing that we should bring up. You said, let's bring, let's see if my computer, ah, here it says, and you, you talked about exercise. Uh, being physically active may help reduce one's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, even in older patients, according to a study in the online April 18th issue of Neurology. Any, yes. Any comments about that? Oh, uh, the amount of evidence that's accumulating in the medical literature that indicates that exercise can help prevent dementia is accumulating. It's, it's great. Um, Dr. Larson, who actually used to be um, chair of the Board of Regents for the American College of Physicians, um, published the ACT trial in the Annals of Internal Medicine mm -hmm. um, in the mid-2000s, I believe, that really demonstrated that exercise had a much more profound effect in terms of preventing dementia and delaying the progression of dementia more than uh, medications. What about the medications? You know, um, Dinepazil and Mamantine are the you know, Aricept and Namenda, okay? There's a, other kinds of Aricept, but there's not another kind of Namenda. And I generally start with Aricept and then move to add Namenda when they get severe, and I use it for a while, and, and then sometimes I go forever on it. Sometimes I cut it out depending upon what the family wants. What's your take on those two medicines for Alzheimer's disease? Um, I, I do very much the same thing. Uh, but when I prescribe uh, medications like Aricept and uh, Mementine, uh, Namenda, it comes along with a lot of counseling so that people have the appropriate expectation. Uh, these medications are not wonder drugs. Uh, no. Uh, and they're expensive. They're expensive. Fortunately, I practice in an environment where the cost aspects of medications are not necessarily apparent to the patients. Um, it's one of the nice benefits that the VA can offer our uh, nation's veterans. But it's important that people be aware that the benefits of these medications are temporary, um, that they typically delay progression of dementia by six months, maybe a year at most. Yeah, I've been told that if you look at the progression is this is what Alzheimer's is doing. You know? And of course, I think in some people it's this, sometimes it's this, I mean it's a long, so, but let's say that you're doing this deteriorating and here's how it's going. You take Aricept and you go up a bit and then you still continue the same line, or Namenda and you still, can, you, so you're deteriorating but it gives you a hike up on the, on the, the downhill slope. What I'd probably draw that curve a little bit differently. How would you draw it? I'd probably do a little more of a horizontal instead of having a gradual. I might draw a little bit horizontal and then continue the progression. Oh, okay. 
So you wouldn't say it's that much of a step up. It just improved. I've seen some people drastically improved where when they were completely numb, I mean, mum, mum, the Aeroset brought her to singing again. She still didn't know her husband well, very, very demented, but now she could sing, and it made everything for him. I mean, he was so happy because she could sing. And then we did the Nemen, and then he, he, she got better too. But it's only a temporary deal. That deterioration does continue. There's no question. It, it does. We all, I don't see that as a nice topic. Any other comments about Alzheimer's that you want to make sure that we, sit, we speak about? Well, I think that when we take care of patients with Alzheimer's disease, I think it's very critical that as healthcare professions, we acknowledge the importance of the caregiver. Um, the, the husband or wife who's caring for that person? Husband, wife, um, children, uh, um, and maybe extended family members as well. Or friend. Or friend. Um, that oftentimes those individuals are overlooked in terms of our, when we give focus on the patient. But in reality, I mean, the way I explain it to my patients, actually to my patients' families, is that while the patient is here, my goal is really to take care of the caregiver, um, that we need to provide support um, for them. For that unsung hero, true definitely, hero. Definitely. True hero. When my uh, grandfather got sick, was it, a couple years back, you know, I had my brother and my mother and myself take turns in the hospital sitting after him. And after a week, I could not, re I was amazed about how fatigued I was. And it wasn't really hard work, you know, it was just sort of sitting there and paying attention, but um, mentally it was very fatiguing. Yep. So these people who take care of their loved ones day in, day out, I mean, they're oh. utter heroes. Oof. All right, well, uh, let's take the next question. Whether or not that you can catch up on sleep. I Oftentimes I get only a couple hours sleep and then the next night I might get eight, uh, I might get four hours sleep, wondering if by then going ahead and sleeping 10, 12 hours that that will help or have I already lost that sleep when I'm sleep deprived? I'm smiling because this of course applies to every physician. <laughs> yeah, not enough sleep. Yeah, I don't know of uh, uh, many who, who really get enough sleep. That's the truth. I, I know that too. I mean, that's not, that's my life too. Probably yours too. Yes. So what's your response? Do you, do you think that at the end of the week and you have the weekend off perhaps that, that, that you sleep extra, it, it catches you up? I mean, can, you, can we be sleep deprived? Can we catch up? My dad said so. What do you think? Well, you know, I'm not one to contradict your dad. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think the physiologic data says that there is a, a component in which you can catch up sleep. The time limit in which you can catch up that sleep is very limited. But the, perhaps the bigger issue is really the need for everyone to try to avoid that sleep, sleep deprivation. Because while it may be helpful to try to keep, keep up, catch up with sleep, I mean, when you're sleep deprived, I mean, the evidence is quite clear in terms of your increased risk for car accidents. Um, that, so maybe the, more, the message here is try to avoid becoming sleep deprived right. and missing sleep. Right, I, I was gonna, and, and you know, of course that's, we should do. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Correct. There you go. Uh, well, and I do think that we talked about this uh, last week on this show, on a sleep apnea show, uh, and Dr. Herrick said, yes, it is a deal, and yes, uh, you can catch up, but there is, as you said, a time limit. You can't, you know, be sleep deprived for a long time, you know, and then expect to catch up, at, you know, after two months. But I would give you this experience. When I was an intern a thousand years ago, and I went, I remember working something like 105 hours a month, mm -hmm. a week. You know, it was just unbelievable. You'd be up all night. That was a long time night. ago then. That was a long time. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. And um, uh, I remember falling asleep at many stops stoplights on the way home. And uh, I think by the end of the intern year, mm -hmm. I was goofy. I could remember feeling emotionally overwrought and high and sad and emotionally just labile, you know, up and down and up and down. And then this junior year, there mm -hmm. was more sleep. And suddenly, 
things came into focus again. So I believe that uh, that Kari's question about sleep deprivation is a good one, and it hits the nail on the head. It's real. I think we need to not do that to our bodies, and yep. so let's do as I say, not not as I do. All right. Well, take the next question then, please. Whether or not, because I know we have heard um, quite a few discussions and debates about whether it's cell phones are doing actual any damage, um, always, you know, talking close to your ear. Um, I've heard that the, you can get, you know, tumors or um, any anything, of course, if it's too loud. But is there any real um, studies or uh, recommendations with so much prolonged use of the cell phone? You know, Michael, they, they, is there a recommendation that's come from the ACP or from any national organization about cell phone use? I don't think that there is necessarily a recommendation, but I think uh, common sense and certainly I think a lot of states are addressing this from a law standpoint where it's probably, you should probably avoid using your cell phone, texting, doing GPS, when you're answering driving. phone while you're driving. Um, I think the evidence is quite clear that um, being a distracted driver is as bad as being a drunk driver. Right. So here's the risk for uh, ab abnormal uh, driving with messaging and phoning and all that stuff. Huge, right? <laughs> the risk for brain tumor from the exposure of the phone to your ear is, you know, maybe, maybe there's something. But it's nothing like what you made. Right. Well, um, let's do the next question. If you had a blood clot, how long do you have to stay on the blood thinner before you can get off it? So that depends upon the reason for the blood clot. I mean, I have a patient who has a blood clot to her lung, and now mm -hmm. she's bleeding on, in her stomach from the, with Coumadin. Mm. And so after, you know, four or five months, we're dropping the Coumadin because the risk of the, the Coumadin or Warfarin is more than the risk of the return of the clot. There's a, it depends upon the risks that that anticoagulation carries with it. And certainly older people who might be falling somewhere, that risk of hurting themselves uh, with the warfarin overcomes the benefit, right? Correct. What are the reasons why we'd use warfarin? This man talked about clotting in general, clotting in the leg. What else? Uh, so what else? Um, I think there are certain uh, hypercoagulable um, conditions. Um, uh, so these are conditions that increase your risk for having um, clots. Um, pregnancy uh, will sometimes bring that out and you'll find these people who have hypercoagulable states. Atrial fib? Uh, so atrial fibrillation, um, there, of course we, there is that new medication on the market. Um, yeah, what's your th thought about, the, there's a couple new anticoagulants on the market wh wh that they don't need all that pro time. Uh, Am I allowed to say product? name because uh, <laughs> I can't remember how to pronounce it. Well, say, say it. I mean, it's a new product that's out there. Uh, Pradaxa. Yeah, Pradaxa is one. There's another, but Pradaxa is the one that's right. wanting to take the atrial fib uh, market from the warfarin. What is atrial fib? So atrial fibrillation is um, a condition where the heart beats irregularly. And um, the risk of clots is? Increases. In by how much? Um, well, it, of, of course, it depends on what your risk factors are. Okay. so. Um, it goes up with each risk factor, such as? Uh, so that would be hypertension, age, um, diabetes, stroke, right. so and those, heart failure. And that makes your chances of a clot from atrial fib go from like 4 or 6 or 8 percent to 12 and 15 percent yes. per year. And if you take the warfarin, it reduces it four times. Correct. That's about right, right? Correct. Okay. Now the Pradaxa is just about as, it's probably a little bit better. The data says one or two percent better. Of course, if you look at the numbers, that ends up being, by a relative number is 10 or percent, but a real number is like one percent more. Well, I don't know if I would agree with that. Okay, um, you like the Prodaxa. Actually, I, I don't. Um, the study that the FDA used to approve Prodaxa was a non-inferiority study, so it was not a, Superiority study. Um, it did not. It did not prove that Pradaxa was better than Coumadin or Warfarin. It was just no worse than. And somehow we've come somewhere along the way. We've come up with the fact that Pradaxa is better than Coumadin. And it is not. It's the same as. It's it's, it's, it's not four times as expensive. Better. 
It's four times as expensive, even if you're checking pro times and count that as the cost of warfarin, it's still four times as expensive. And you don't know compliance. Correct. See, uh, if I have a person on warfarin, I know they're taking their medicine. I I've been checking their pro time. If they're on Prodaxa, you don't know. And it's dosed twice a day as and well. So, and what, what is the issue of compliance? How good is the best compliance? How good is our people's pill taking? Compliance means how well do people take their pills? What, well, people's what, compliance is bad. Uh, I think even in the best circumstances, people may be 90%. Uh, you know, the best would be 90% uh, compliant to taking their medicine. And, and, and the reality is somewhere around 50 or 60% of the so people really don't take the pills like we think they are. And certainly with Pradoxa, when you're not being tested every month. You're not held accountable for taking it. <laughs> you, so I'm, I'm very reluctant about Pradoxa too. That's my issue. But I think there, are, are, there is, I mean, I have used Pradoxa. Um, the one circumstance I've used Pradoxa was in a gentleman who lived in a r very rural part of uh, Indiana. It took him 45 minutes to get to a hospital or a clinic to get his blood drawn. And that's an hour and a half round trip. So you just said, here, we don't need to check your pro time. Right. Here's the Prodox. And there's a time to do almost any, t any medicine. There's a time and place for it, isn't it? Yes. We've got a little time for one more question. Well, I lack a lot of energy. I was just wondering if uh, it would be an iron issue, I guess. And if there's any way that I mean, you could tell me if that would be an issue or not. I think it's a great question. There's probably not one question I have more than I'm feeling tired, Doc. What? Why have I got malaise and fatigue, as we as we phrase it in the medical literature? What's the answer? Do you think it's iron? Uh, m probably not. Um, the gentleman looked um, young. Young, um, pretty good shape. Uh, so it's probably very unlikely he's iron deficient. I think what we need to probably focus on in this situation is to make sure that he gets enough sleep. So that's where the sleep deprivation comes in. I think he eat regularly and healthily and to exercise. I think the most, I nailed it right there, perfect. I think, and, and I, you think about it. These people are sitting on their duffs and they come in and go, I'm so tired. Why are, I, are you tired? Well, are you doing anything? No, I'm just sitting there. I'm so tired. I think a lot of them are depressed. Uh, and, uh, but you don't say, oh, well, you're tired because you're depressed and you're not exercising, you know, he'll never come to my office again. Uh, and the reality is this man may have something wrong. There might be a bleeding process going Perhaps. on in his colon. There's something happening. You know, maybe he's, his, uh, his wife is, is uh, being mean uh, or maybe he's drinking too much or it, who knows? Uh, he really needs to have a good time and somebody will listen. And, and do a careful exam. We got one person, to, how about that vaccine question? I'm going to Panama this summer and I have to get uh, immunizations like typhoid and yellow fever and I'm just wondering if there's any side effects from getting those. So Michael? It's a good time. Yeah. Oh, it's a good time to go to Panama? Well, I hope she has a good time in Panama. Oh, I do too. Doesn't that sound like there's a great trip going ahead of her? So um, what do you recommend about vaccinations? Um, well, I guess it sort of depends on which part of Panama she's going to. Uh, if she's going to be staying in Panama City um, or along the, the canal, I'm not sure she necessarily needs uh, then, the yellow fever. Um, it, if, if she's going to part of the rainforest, then yeah, perhaps she does need the yellow fever. Um, there's a particularly malignant um, illness called yellow fever that the mosquitoes carry in that part of it. So I would say the vaccines, are they dangerous? Do they have side effects? I think all uh, vaccines have the potential for side effects. Um, generally speaking, those side effects are minimal. Um, they do not affect uh, many people at all, but there's all the potential. Okay. We've got another question from the man on the street. I'm a bad smoker, and I get mad when people tell me to quit. Um, I have a hard time with that. And my only other question would be what I asked Rick the other day is how come don't you guys ever get sick? What preventions do you guys do that you never get sick? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I think I've gotten sick enough where I've got immune, immunity to most everything. That's why I don't quite get sick. Plus, I wash my hands every time I turn around. I, and I, or I use the, certainly I use- the alcohol I, hand the wipes. The alcohol hand wipes for respiratory, not for colon. 
illnesses, diarrhea illnesses, boy, I go right to the soap and water. Mm. What about smoking? Uh, that's an important issue. I mean, you sent me some information about smoking and the American College Physicians' uh, opinion about uh, monitoring and recommending treatment for smoking. What, what do you do for people who want to quit? Well, I think the first, um, in terms of the uh, caller, um, I think it's, it's very important that she be aware that when people do approach her about quitting smoking, it really is an act of caring. Um, that people are not doing this to try to be harmful or mean to her, but they really do care about her to try to get her to quit smoking because it is the, really the healthy thing to do. That's so important. Thank you for that. <laughs> Very good. Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. Yeah, I get high with a little help from my friends. Oh, I'm gonna try with a little help from my friends. What is a friend? The word comes from the German Freund, which in turn originates from an Indo-European root, meaning to love, shared by free. Thus, a friend is defined as a person of mutual affection that is free of sexual or family relations. Still, there are many more definitions of friendship. Friends care, support, listen, open up, and then in the end are loyal. It is almost like the ethics of medicine. Friends try to benefit and not harm their pals, do it honestly, all while respecting the other guy's freedom to choose. There are a lot of great quotes about the value of friendship. Some unknown author said, a friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you've forgotten the words. Charles Caleb Colton said, true friendship is like sound health. The value of it is seldom known and until it's lost. Emily Dickinson said, my friends are my estate. And of course, John Lennon said, I get by with a little help from my friends. In this era of the web and such things as Facebook and Twitter, apparently it's a sign of influence by how many one has friended. Isn't it ironic that the technology of the internet is instead isolated? people? Several studies even indicate the internet may be a major reason why there has been a decline in the number and quality of friendships nowadays. Certainly humans are hardwired to have friends. Anthropologists tell us that a village is limited to the size of about 150 people because that's the maximum number of friends one can get to know when limited only by human verbal skills. The challenge and perhaps disadvantage of friendship turns around the listening and the unselfish giving and the honesty and the freedom of choice that is required with true friendship. But health advantages of friendship are enormous. Solid scientific studies find those with strong friendships have better mental and physical health, increased longevity, and a deeper sense of happiness. The opposite is also true. Those friendless have increased risk for heart disease, more infections, and a higher incidence of cancer. Of course, these illnesses come to people with friends too. But survival is longer and easier to those who are connected. It is so true that in this tough and tumble world, we get by with a little help from our friends. Comment about the, va the health value of friendship, Michael. I echo everything you just said. You know, for my patients, humans are social creatures. Um, we do better when we have friends. Uh, and sometimes my uh, older adults um, tend to be very isolated. And I oftentimes prescribe them to go out and make new friends. That's a great prescription. And you know, speaking of friends, thank you for coming all this way from Indiana to be here on this show with me. And of course, you know, you're paid twice as much as I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thank very, you. I'm very glad to be here. That's great. I sincerely thank our studio guest, Dr. Michael Shaw from Indiana University for helping answer all of the wonderful questions from our audience. 
Jane Goodall got it right when she said, only if we understand can we care. Only if we care will we help. Only if we help shall they be saved. Until next time, stay healthy out there. Funding for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health. The Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.